Okay, we are here. Welcome everyone. Thank you all for being here to the Big Apple Film Festival conferences. And we are discussing distribution. And we are here today with our guest, Julia Verdin. Hello, Julia, how you doing? I think the, are you muted? I think you might be muted there. I am indeed. Ah. Hello, everybody, and lovely to be here. Thank you so much for asking me to join you and, and looking forward to meeting everybody. Cool. Well, thank you, Julia, for being here. So Julia has um, uh, experienced the industry as a producer, as a filmmaker. Um, she has been involved with the production of films that have starred numerous Golden Globe winners and Golden Globe nominees and Academy Award winners like Al Pacino, um, uh, David Arquette, uh, who is also a, if I'm not mistaken, a Golden Globe nominee, uh, and the list goes on. Um, but let me ask uh, Julia if you could uh, tell us a little about your background, some <clears throat> projects you've been involved with over the years, and then we'll jump into some questions focusing on uh, distribution. Sure. Um, yes. Well, I've, I've been involved in pretty much all aspects of filming, having started as an actress very early on um, uh, in my career. And that acting background has stood me in good stead and, and really helped me with story development and character development. So very grateful for that and, and looked into producing. I ran a company as an executive in London many years ago and then set up, came out here, set up a company here, I've been making independent films for, oh my God, about 30 years now. And also directed a number of projects and found that I, I love that. And um, uh, yep, yeah, funded projects, um, got projects distributed out into the marketplace. You know, when you're an independent film, you, you, you kind of need to be a multi-hyphenate and learn to do as much as, as you possibly can yourself. I'm also an educator. I, I um, teach classes in film. I recently set up, we set up a website called thefilmclasses.com, which has, you know, if anyone wants to delve deeper into distribution or production or anything else, that's a resource available for you all. And I also wrote a book called Success in Film, which is the guide to kind of how to fund and, and make an independent film. I had, used to have so many people come to me and say, hey, can I come over and pick your brains? I thought, you know what, the best thing is just to put it all in a book. And then it's, it's really easy and I can just start handing out copies of the, of the book. But I love filmmaking and, and I think distribution is a great topic because these days with equipment getting so much cheaper and more accessible it's it's a lot easier to actually make a film the issue is once you've made a film how do you get it visible and seen and i i think it's something that we really have to to think about today as filmmakers and and the more you can educate yourself about the marketplace that you're playing in so you have the knowledge to, to, to help you on the pathway to success, the better. So glad you're all here and, and hopefully I can shed a little bit of light on it for you. Yeah, so, you know, we look at some of your projects, for example, Least Among You, Born of War. So these films were released by Lionsgate. Um, you've had films that have been released on some of the major streaming platforms, for example, HBO Max. Um, so let, let me get into some questions. So if anybody, on you know everybody on here wants to first begin by asking um or telling us about their project perhaps and if they have any questions regarding how to go about finding a distributor or or you know if they plan to distribute it themselves uh feel free to put a question in the chat box or if you would like to uh if you would like to to um you know just ask the question feel free to you can just raise your hand uh however you want to go about it is fine um yeah but in the meantime, uh, let me ask uh, one of the main things about distribution that most of the larger distribution, most distribution companies look for are name talent in a narrative film. So like I mentioned, I mean, you've worked with some, some pretty big talent. Um, like I mentioned, like Merchant of Venice had Al Pacino, you had a film with David Arquette um, and uh, amongst many others. Um, so 
uh, is that, does that still hold true today um, with all the streaming platforms that have so much content? Do most distributors still look for name actors and talent in a feature narrative film? Is that still just as important? Very much so. And I, I, I think the, you know, what, what I always advise filmmakers to do is to think about who your audience is uh, very early on in the process, right in the development process and um, how are you going to reach them? Because if you, if you can kind of cast your film with talent that, that the audience you're, you're targeting um, respond to and like, you know, you're more likely to, to engage them. And obviously like a lot of the big name actors out there have big fan bases and big followings. So by casting one of them, you're more liable to get your film visible. Now, having said that, that there are exceptions to that rule and, and every year we see, you know, those, those little films with no names in that, that kind of knock it out of the park and win Sundance Awardience Awards or, or get rave reviews at South by Southwest or Toronto or, you know, one of those festivals. Um, and, you know, like Whale Rider, Chloe Zhao's, you know, first film that had no names in, you know, she was, she was an unknown entity at the time, but that, that film was just a beautifully well-made film and it, it captured audiences imagination and, and it got great visibility. So I, I do think sometimes, you know, if you, if you, if you can't afford the, big names and your budget and resources just don't allow that, then the more you can work on just really strong visual storytelling and, and crafting your, your story beautifully and, and really spending the time in prep to actually kind of have a plan for what you want to say with your movie and, and what you're going to do it and meticulously shot list it and design the film etc the, the more chance you'll have of, of potentially being one of those breakout films and and it's a, a lot of it has to do with the script you know i think so many filmmakers today i consult for a lot of filmmakers and many a times i have filmmakers come to me you know for advice wanting to do a consultation about how to make their film and get it funded and I go, whoa, you know, hold on a second before you jump into all of that. Is your script ready? And more often than not, in fact, in pretty much every case, the script still needs work. And if, if you know, once you send out your scripts and you get it into those big talent agencies, et cetera, they're going to do coverage on it. And if your script is not really you know strong enough on those characters don't have solid arcs and it's not really there or it's full of typos or hasn't been proofread or you know whatever it is right you're going to get bad coverage and then they're, they're not going to like offer you their top talent and it's going to be kind of earmarked as a project now nah, that's not you know support this is really you no know, not kind of up to par but if your script is really great you know, and it gets a kind of like a 10 out of 10, right? You know, then, then your project will be in the, you know, this is a project we love pile. Send this out to talent interested in, in doing a eclectic independent films or, you know, the, the, these roles are so well written, this could potentially get one of our clients an award. Right, let, let me um, go over to um, uh, Joanna, I believe has a question. Joanna, if you want to just, yeah, hello, hello there. Hi. Hi, thank you. Hi, Julia. Um, a question I have, it's sort of two part. Um, I have a feature uh, documentary and I'm working with a lot of people now who have true stories and are interested in getting their stories out. And when it comes to buying the life rights and that process, I wonder if you have any information, um, you know, just in terms of timing and stages, if uh, if there's people who are interested and want and trust me and want to do this, um, you know what get, goes into the life rights part of it. But then also when it comes to crafting the script, is there 
you know, it's hard. I've been to some film festivals and trying to network and find the right people to help with the screenwriting uh, side of things. Um, and it's just, you know, people get busy and I don't know, is there sort of a resource or database to try to find people who uh, would be interested in reading scripts or helping to collaborate, um, that type of thing? I, I, I think, uh, uh, well, I think, I think it's a two pronged um, question and good question, by the way. Um, so, so firstly, to, to address the, 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 what rights you need, if, if you're doing a true story, you need to, to make sure that you, you, you have um, the, the person's life rights and so you have everything that you need. And it always, as with any rights, it can be complicated. So your best bet is to find yourself a good um, production attorney. And so a production attorney is, is an ent attorney who is um, uh, certified in entertainment law and experienced in entertainment law in particular. Um, there's a number of good ones out there. A good way to find one is to um, ask other filmmakers you know, who they recommend or look at document other documentaries and see who's done the, whose name keeps coming up under the production legal section. You know, certainly I can recommend you um, a couple of people if you want to get in contact. And then with regard to getting feedback on your work, um, even when you're doing a documentary, you still need to create like a, a story outline. You need to have some idea of where you're going to go with it. Now, when you do a documentary, sometimes things come up or things surprise you, right? And that could take it in another direction, but I, I would really recommend having some type of plan up up front so you you know you, you you've got kind of you've got some structure and direction to to go in. and and it'll also really help your editors when you get to the post stage and start editing now you can get paid coverage there's a number of companies and individuals that that provide coverage you now i've done coverage you know we do coverage for people and and we do script consultation um, I've done a lot of script coaching with writers too. You could also join a good writers group and um, find a, a group of writers you know, whose work you like and, and take it in terms every week to give feedback on each other's work. And that won't cost you anything. And that can often be a great first step, right? Just to kind of you know get your script to a place where it's as good as can be and then go through that for you know then potentially think about going for some final you know paid coverage from an industry expert when you feel it's as good as possibly can be to to get final feedback on it I, I think getting feedback on your work is invaluable you know when I, I write as well and even though I, I do script coaching and coverage for others I always get feedback on my own work because you need objective opinions. You know, you can also often get so buried in your own material that, that you can't see the wood for the trees. You know, when you do a rewrite and you make substantial changes um, that you can accidentally leave little orphans behind. So you, you, you need to get your kind of work checked and, and you need that feedback from others. Yeah, I was also just going to say, yeah, if you're looking for, um, you know, legal counsel, we had um, some entertainment, uh, entertainment attorneys speak uh, at our film festival uh, over the years. So um, if you want to email us, I mean, I can give you some of those names. We had uh, Gabrielle Ludlow from Cinepoint Advisors. Um, she was legal counsel on some films like Lady Bird, Greta Gerwig's film, The Disaster Artist, which was James Franco's film. Um, and then we have Rosalind Richter as well, um, who was also legal counsel on some projects for HBO. Uh, and actually an Academy Award nominated documentary called My Architect. Um, so, you know, if you are interested, you can certainly email and I can provide you those, you know, the contact information for them if you want to get in touch. They're based in New York. Um, any other, uh, do we have um, any other questions? Anybody else want to jump in here and ask a question? Feel free. All right. Um, Julie, let me ask you about in terms of film festivals. So, 
you know, for example, you're, you're at a film called Two Jacks, um, and that screened at some big festivals in Canada, Montreal, Vancouver. Now it does have some names in there. It has Jack Houston and Sienna Miller and um, yeah, Jacqueline Bissett, who's a legendary uh, actress. Um, so do you, I mean, yes, you had those, that talent in there, but do you feel that screening at those festivals um, helped, you know, get it distributed and get it out into the world, even though you had the name talent, did the festivals kind of help it along? Um, the, the, if, on that film, I, we, the festivals didn't really help. I ended up finding the distribution um, myself, not through any of the film festivals, but the, what the festivals did help us with was getting some good visibility and press. The Montreal Film Festival was a wonderful experience. I must say they looked after us very well and we had a, a, a great time up there. Danny and Jack and, and myself went up and they organized a press conference. So we got a lot of like good um, press out of going to that festival and they did like a nice little red carpet screening and it was great meeting all the other filmmakers there and and um, the audience was very engaged and loved the film and 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 then all those people odds are would have would have recommended it to friends so it was it was it was good and same at most of the other film festivals that we were at so I love film festivals myself and I, I, I think you want to be selected. You know, you want to to think about what your goals are with your festival strategy, and um, so you want to attend festivals where you're going to, you know, hopefully either get some press or or if you if you're looking for distribution, festivals that distributors attend and. Um, uh, get you know, good visibility because uh, it's, 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 it can be tricky because if you're doing a smaller independent film and you've only got a limited budget to work with, you're going to have to be picky as to which festivals that you enter. Um, so sometimes some festivals, if, you know, if they're good fit, you can always reach out to the festival or if you get into some of the bigger festivals, sometimes you'll get invited to festivals. And then if you're invited to film festivals and they have like a good audience of interested people. I'm usually all for going. And, and, and I just love meeting other filmmakers. And I think it's important that we all share experiences with each other and, and, and talk and communicate. So yeah, it's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. Anybody, again, if anybody has any, do you want to tell us about your film project, the script you're working on or, or, a film that you've completed that you want to ask about in terms of specifically about distribution, feel free to put a question in the chat box or you can just, you know, unmute and ask your question. Okay. Um, all right. So Julia, let, let me ask you um, now, wait, just stepping away from distribution for just, just a moment. You know, you, like I mentioned before, I mean, you, you know, you, you produced um, films that have been released by Lionsgate, uh, Sony Picture Classics released Merchant of Venice. Um, for filmmakers who are just starting out, how do they go about, you know, working on projects of that magnitude? How do you become a producer on a, a larger, higher budget film like that? How do you get from the smaller independent films to the more, I guess we'd call it mainstream content? I, I think it's just developing great material, you know? So, so, so if, if, you know, having having kind of like ideas, thinking about what's working in the marketplace or, or what the audience wants. And um, teaming up with talented writers, if you're not a kind of producer that writes yourself, then, then what you want to do is find some great writers to work with, you know, find people whose work you really respond to and, and, and love and team up with them and 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 work together to to create magical scripts right so I, th I think when you have really good material it, it you know it, it is possible to attach name talent right. and sometimes you 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 have to think about all right my skills are x and x but i don't have access to talent mm. so how do i how do i get around that could I hire a casting director, for example, or could I find another producer to bring onto the project who does have 
that type of access and can help us you know, with getting the talent package aspect together. Right. Uh, speaking again of Montreal Film Festival, you mentioned that was a great, great, a great experience. Uh, Frances had a question. She put it in the chat box here. Uh, she said, I'm a newbie screenwriter whose first script was selected by the Montreal Independent Film Festival. I'd love to get my script read by Rob Lowe or John Stamos. <laughs> um, cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any thoughts on that? How would they, how would, how would Frances get her script to, uh, to those actors? So um, uh, I would look up on IMDb Pro and find out who the manager is for Rob Lowe and for John Stamos. If you don't have IMDb Pro yourself, maybe you've got a friend who does, or maybe there's someone else on the panel who could help you out with that. And um, then um, just call you know you you have to come up with a compelling pitch the worst case scenario is that they say no or come back with us to an offer or, or if you're not financed or the other thing you can do is like john stamos i believe also directs so it might be easier to approach him as a an actor director um I don't, I don't think Rob Lowe has a production company, but it might be worth checking into because a lot of actors nowadays have production companies. So if you can't get anywhere with the agent or manager, maybe sending it into the production company could be another possible way to go. Or, 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 or look at that kind of six degrees of separation thing. You know, like put out on your Facebook, hey, I'm trying to get my, I've, I've got this great script about X, so I'm trying to find a way to get Rob to Rob Lowe. You know, anyone got a, uh, anyone able to help me, right? You never know. It's just possible that someone knows, someone who knows Rob Lowe, who might be able to, might be able to help. And I think if you don't just put out what you're trying to do you 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 might miss out on on help that that's available so i'm i'm a great proponent for just letting everybody know what you're trying to achieve and what you need help with and and then just see what happens but if you don't verbalize it no one knows that you need help in that area yeah, you know, speaking of which, uh, actually, um, Andy just put in the chat box here, uh, St. Amos Productions. I guess they're based, they're based in LA. Uh, so I guess if you're interested in trying to get in touch with, with those actors, St. Amos Productions, it looks like, is, uh, is, the, is, is where they are. Uh, I'm assuming that's John Stamos's production. Uh, it's John Stamos's. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you very much for that. Uh, actually, I had a question, you know, regarding actors again. Uh, you actually had a film a while back that had uh, Molly Ringwald and another one with uh, Christopher Lloyd. And, yeah. you know, it's interesting because speaking about people like John Stamos and Rob Lowe, um, you know, they were obviously like in the 80s, they were pretty big. I mean, Rob Lowe is still in the show now and John Stamos works a lot as well. I mean, so they're, they're out there. But in the 80s, you know, they were they were big. And, and again, those actors like that I mentioned you worked with, Rob, Molly, Ring, Molly Ringwald, Christopher Lloyd, uh, as well, they were bigger, like in the eighties. Well, well, like yeah, are actors actually, like still relevant, like in making a project now? Well, well, actually, what well, you know, one thing to know about Molly Ringwald is, is she was also on Riverdale, which is one of the most popular teen shows. But it, but and, and and she's incredibly talented. But she's you know not as busy in film as she used to be. But. She's an amazing talent. So sometimes checking into someone like that, and then we looked at Molly, you know, she's working on Riz Riverdale. So now she's also tapped in that, to that teen fan base, which was the audience for that film. And she was perfect for the role. So she ended up being a good, a good choice. And she's a wonderful actress and great to work with. And um, so, you know, that, that was a, a very successful. And Christopher Lloyd is just wonderful too. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think I think you know with casting, it's always good to just think a little bit outside the the box. And and there's there's so many great talents around that are a little bit un underutilized. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So I guess so names like that, I, I would certainly still be very, you know, would still be very um, interesting to a distributor, right? Even if you have 
you know, yeah, actors like, let's say Rob Lowe, John Stamos, I mean, they would certainly be interested. Uh, yeah. I would, I would imagine, yeah. Um, so, uh, Mike, I think, does Joanna have a question? I see the hand thing raised here. I don't know if that's from before. I don't know if Joanna has a question. Um, all right. Um, so let me ask you, in terms of, um, it, in terms of, of, uh, of financing, I'm sorry, we've been talking about distribution. Uh, big question is, do you, you know, it's sort of like the chicken or the egg thing. They say, well, you need to have name talent attached in order to get financing. But in order to get the financing, they want to know that those, you know, they want to, you know, in order to be able to get the financing, they have to know that those people are attached. How does that work? Do you have to get the actors attached first before you can seek out financing? Or do you need to get the financing first that you can present to the actors and say, you know, here, we have the, we have the budget? I think it really varies from project to project. I mean, that the way I've always approached things, Rob, is each project it's its own animal, and it's 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 finding a, a plan that works for that particular project. And 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 every film has been funded in a different way. And so, you know, when when filmmakers come to consult with me, and if they're when they're looking for help to get their projects funded. First question I usually ask is like, what's your goal? What are you trying to achieve? And then depending on that is, you know, we, we, we try and find a plan that's achievable for them because everybody has different resources and everyone's got different goals. So the important thing is, is finding a plan that if you want to actually get something done rather than a year later still talking about it, is finding, find, you know, looking at the resources that you've got available to you and then finding a plan that works for your project. And sometimes if a project's too big and you're, you, you've got a project with a first time director and your first time filmmakers, it may be a question of, of putting that on hold and making that your second project and finding something simpler to make as your first project or as, as your calling card or finding a way to scale that script down if you want to tell that particular story to a way that you can do it on, on a, 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 a budget that's going to be a little more achievable to, to, to raise so you can actually get it made. Because if you're a first time filmmaker and you're trying to make a 10 million budget film, then you're going to need to get some pretty heavyweight names to support that budget, right? If you're a first time filmmaker, agents and managers are a lot more reticent about having their talent work with a first timer because they've no idea about how the film's going to end up. Right. So if their talent's getting a million dollars per movie, then they, they do a film with a first time director and for whatever reason, even though the script was great, it doesn't pan out into the success that it, you know, the potential that it looked like it had, mm -hmm. but instead goes straight to VOD and doesn't really do any business. And so is considered a, in business terms, a flop, right? Yeah. That actor's value is going to plummet. And so on the next movie, they only get half a million. Right. Agents lost commission, right? Actors lost revenue. Mm -hmm. They're not happy. So agents and managers are quite protective about their top tier talent because of that very reason. And I think, you know, when you understand how the business works, then it's easier to you know, to, to, to be a little bit more realistic and, and work your way around it. Right. Um, now, in terms of, of, um, of finding, and again, before I move on, yeah, again, if anybody has any questions or wants to tell us about their project or ask any questions, feel free to, you know, just go ahead and ask, or you can put it in the chat box. Um, but in terms of financing, so you'll have, often filmmakers will make, let's say, a short film as a calling card in order to get financing. But let's say they're not able to get the financing and they're not able to move forward. Is there an opportunity to distribute a short film? Is there anywhere where a, a filmmaker who just has a short and they were never able to get it beyond that to get it distributed somehow? Oh yeah. No, I mean, we, you know, the, the short film that I made, um, Lost Girls, um, 
has been a, a, available on Amazon. It's an educational distribution. We've actually done we've actually done really well with it. And the running um, time had like a lot. What's the running 25 time? Twenty five minutes. Okay. But twenty five minutes now. Now in general, you know, as, as you you would probably say, Rob, you know, for for film festivals, better length is ten to fifteen minutes, right? Yeah, generally, yeah, yeah. Because it fits better. It fits into programming slots um, better. You know, I wanted to make the film that I wanted to make, and I needed twenty five minutes to tell the story effectively. Mm. And I, 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 you know, I, I, my goal with the short film was to make a short that raised raises awareness on child trafficking. Yeah. And I wanted that film to be used for education on the issue. So that was my main goal, rather than playing in festivals. Right. As it happened, it did get into a lot of film festivals, but I, I knew it would be more challenging with a 25 minute film to get into festivals. When you do make those longer films, they have to be extra good for a festival to give it its you know, a longer, you know, one of the precious longer slots. Right. You know, is that would that would you do, agree with that? Yeah, well, most you're the festival expert more than me, <laughs> but but I know that you know a lot of your your programming blocks are probably like you're looking for ten to fifteen minute films to fill those blocks, right? Uh, yeah, I would say our festival and the majority of festivals that I've attended also as a guest and, you know, I've been also to Sundance and South by and all the other regional festivals. It seems like the majority of the shorts, including our own festival. Yeah, if they fall within that 15, maybe 17 minute range, you know what I mean? Something like that, I would say. Yeah, so, 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 you know, when you're doing a short, if, if you're aiming for, for getting into festivals, if you've got a 10 to 15 minute short, you've got a better shot of getting in because each festival may have like 25 spots for films that length. Yeah. And they may only have like two spots for the longer shorts. Right. So, right. you know, or, or whatever, because I'll put the, the longer shots, put two in one block or, or whatever, and then they want the other blocks to get as, give as many people opportunities Mm -hmm. as possible and so they tend to go for the the, the shorter length ones do you, um yeah i, I was wondering do you, having the experience now of distributing a, a short film do, do you find that there's a market for shorts do you find that there's audience response for short films oh very much so i think i think there's a growing demand for short film content a lot of the networks now are looking at doing kind of short shorter form series and things too you know so, so I, I, I think that we're going to see a growing market for short film content. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, I mean, you, you know, you could, there's also like international distributors that will distribute shorts. There's a number of them mm. out there right now. I'm a great proponent. You know, I founded a, a nonprofit artists for change. It's artists number four change dot org. Mm. And I'm, I'm a great proponent for filmmakers to make social impact films and and use the medium of film to raise awareness on, on key social issues. And then I think if you're making a short that, that, that's a, a social issue or social impact short, you, you can do, you know, they, it can also be used for education too. So it's, it, it's got a longer life and can serve a real purpose. And you're also uh, making something that, that, that can kind of give back to society and be of service. Right. Um, yeah, what, what are your thoughts on, on self-distribution? Do you think that's a good, good avenue or do you think it's better to sign with a traditional distributor? I, I think it really depends on what your skills are. You know, if you're going to self-distribute, it's all about marketing because if you self-distribute, obviously the revenue is coming right back to you right so there's a, a, a big advantage in that but then if nobody buys your film or no one signs up to rent it you're not going to get any revenue yeah. so i think if you make the decision to whereas if you go for a distributor you know they they often have like better placement on some of the sites and they um, also you know, may do, if we need to find out if, you know, what type of marketing they do, but if you know, they have a good marketing team and they're doing their own marketing, 
they're going to help get your film visible. Now, a lot of distributors do take pretty high commission these days. So then you're faced with the challenge of like, how do I end up making money from my film rather than the distributor making all the, reaping all the, the fruits of, of our like blood, sweat and tears as it were. So, so the key to self distribution is to have a marketing plan. And um, I have a number of filmmakers who've, who've um, self distributed their films and <laughs> done quite well and well from it, but you do need to have a marketing plan and, and you do need to think about, right, how are we going to get the film visible? How are we going to reach our audience and spend a little bit of money on, on ads, et cetera, and be good on your social media and, and get a team together to really push it out there. The, the people who you know who have been successful in self-distribution, uh, how were they successful? How did they go about it? Uh, did they have a very specific sort of niche audience? Was it something like that? Uh, what what was that, um, that helped them succeed? I I, I think it, it, the ones I've seen do particularly well have been the niche audience ones where they were smart about targeting that audience. <laughs> And then getting good word of mouth. So, you know, once you've, you've targeted that audience and you've got, you know, the, the, the first kind of group in seeing it, if they're all recommending it to their friends, mm -hmm. then, you know, then, then it's going to kind of, the word will spread and you get more, more and more um, uh, people watching it and getting more eyeballs on it. Because it's all about how do we get eyeballs on our, on our content today? Do you find that there was more... Yeah more success with self-distribution with documentaries or narratives? I, I think it, it's, it really depends on, I don't think it's about what the content is. I think it's, well, to a certain extent, it's about how good is the content in the first place, yeah. right? But then, it, then it's, it's how good is that filmmaker with their marketing strategy and a plan to get it visible. Mm, right. Because uh, if you just put a film out there uh, you know if you just get your film up, up on Amazon on on any other platform and you do nothing mm -hmm. you're really leaving it to chance as to whether anyone happens to find it or not right so so you you know you have to, to, to you know how are you tagging your product how are you um, marketing it how are you getting visible you know that's that's an important thing to do these days and when you mentioned about like specific niche audiences, targeting a very specific audience, um, would that be like, let's say a documentary about a specific person or perhaps about a specific place that people live in or a specific person that maybe people are a fan of, like something like that um, would be considered sort of like a very targeted niche kind of audience? Uh, absolutely. So then, so then, you know, how would you reach that audience? Could right. you get the, the 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 trade and industry department from that city to stick it on their mailing list as a as a film, you know, a documentary highlighting our city comes out next Friday? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and, and stuff and stuff like that. Could you get you know? Could you get your director interviewed or the person it's about interviewed in the local newspapers in that city? So right. you start to like build a little bit of buzz around it and then once you've built that little bit of buzz then you can get then it's easier to get the next bit of buzz because now you can say all right well here's some press kit clippings that we've already got yeah. we'd love you to write about it too it, it's often often i think people often want to just only go for the big press but sometimes starting with more the you know the homegrown press which is easier mm -hmm. to get can be a great way to to um, build your visibility and to and to get other people interested in writing about you. Right. Um, all right. In the, in the, we have just a few minutes left. Does anybody um, have any questions or anything prior to? Uh, we only have about maybe five minutes. Any questions? Anyone at all? Feel free to put it in the chat box, or you can just go ahead and ask. Okay. All right. So. Um, this is my my last question. Um, actually, no, I'm sorry. I'm gonna ask you two two quick questions here. One is, uh, if a filmmaker puts their film out there on their own, maybe let's even say it's just on YouTube or Vimeo or whatever it might be, um, can they then approach a distributor still, or a distributor say, "Now nah, you've already, you know, people have already seen it. You've already put it out there on your own. I'm not interested." 
I, I think usually most distributors want films that that haven't haven't already been put out online. Yeah. Okay. So I would I would recommend you you know before doing that you approach distributors and see if you get any traction and 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 if you don't get any offers that that seem to make sense to you you know then that's something that you think about yeah. um, doing yourself. Okay. Um, and then lastly, uh, where do you see the theatrical market going now? Is there still a movie theater market for independent films? I mean, I would say yes, with the big studio films, sure. Uh, but with independent films, do you still see a market theatrically? I, I, I think it's, it's, it's I'm, I'm sad to say, but I think it's, it's going to be um, a lot tougher with it, you know, independent films to get an audience to go to the cinema because the, everybody, you know, it was, or we were already struggling before the pandemic. Yeah. But now, you know, people are also worried about the health aspects of, of going out to a cinema and being around a lot of people. Yeah. It's also the cost. So for the the you know a, a couple with kids, you've got to pay for the tickets. You've got to pay for the babysitter. You're going to get some popcorn, etc. When you're there, it's a hundred bucks outing, or you can stay at home and watch it on your big screen TV with the whole family. Mm -hmm. It's an easier it's it's an easier option for them. I think you know die hard fans. We'll go to the cinema you know people will go to the cinema for the big event movies and the studio blockbusters but i think i think with for independent films unless you you do like a you know, limited screening or some sort of special event screening it's 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 more you know it's, i'm sad to say because i'm i'm old school i love cinema and i think there's nothing like an experience of watching a film with other people and that energy in the room is is very special. So personally, I'd love to to see a way to see cinema kept alive and and our, our little cinemas open and and keep getting you know good traction there. Do you think film festivals will um, continue on virtually, or do you think those will go back to the way they were at the at the theater? I I think we'll probably see like more of a uh, a hybrid yeah um uh hybrid events happening because the benefit is is you know they definitely have access to more people right. so you know, of course we get we we can get into kind of slight right complications with geo blocking etc um and if you're getting a film distributed a lot of distributors are not that keen on online film festivals yeah um they they don't mind in person ones or with the online ones, you know, what we found with our distributor on our latest film, for example, that, you know, as long as it was only like 24 hours and it was geoblocked, so it was just a certain area, right? they were fine. Right. Gotcha. Um, all right. So lastly, um, yeah, I mean, of course, you know, much of this is about in this business, of course, is, is who you know. So at the end of these conferences, I like to always ask um, if there, there's a way that our participants can stay in touch with you if they have projects and they want to ask your advice or, you know, move, try to connect with you in some way. Is there something I can put in the chat, in the chat box or if you could type in? Um, uh, yeah. Sure. I put my social media in there at Julia Burden. Um, right. And um, all, also, you know, we, through our website, I think it's info at rough diamond productions.com. Um, uh, I forget what the class's website is, but that goes to Tim and Laura, who do you know, forward them to me when we get queries or or questions. Right. Um, so uh, yeah, always, always there, happy um, to hear from people. All right, great. I put an info at roughdiamondproductions.com in the chat box. Yeah. Okay, cool. So if they write to you and they say, hey, I was on the Big Apple conference, you know, and I got this project and I want to ask you a question, they can get in touch with you through there. Yeah, and I, I, I do, I do, um, you know, we do virtual filmmaker mixes once a month. And so I'm always available, like, you know, I put aside like an hour every month yeah. to make myself available, you know, for whoever's got a question. Mm -hmm. Because I think when people start off, everybody needs a hand or everyone needs a little bit of advice yeah. and a, a bit of help and where they're getting to go. And 
and you know we we want independent films to keep going and so it's it's yeah. you know i think i think those of us with experience have to support those who are starting and, and help them find a way to to make their films in a way that makes sense cool yeah most definitely well i want to thank you so much uh for being here and taking the time uh to speak with us again this is julia verden and i want to thank just yeah everybody for being here and thank you julia for taking the time we really appreciate it and uh, we'll see you again soon. Yeah, well, thank you so much for asking me. And I, I look forward to coming to your film festival um, one year with the next film and, 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 and sharing it. I love film festivals. Right. Thanks for asking me and, and have a great day. And lovely to meet all of you and cool. wishing you all success in filmmaking. <laughs> thank bye. you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye.